This is NASA's Johnson Space Center. Don't worry, we're not going to Mars, at least not today anyway. So why am I here? And how does the incredible science that happens within this center affect you? Even realizing it, space plays a vital role in each of our daily lives. For example, every time you use the internet, make a phone call, or look at a digital map, you are sending and receiving information to and from space. This information travels through large constellations of satellites that orbit Earth. There are two types of commercial satellites that affect us directly, communication satellites and Earth observation satellites. My research focuses on the latter. Earth observation satellites. There are approximately 200 satellites right now in space that are taking images of the Earth that are used for things such as weather prediction, climate change modeling, and tracking biodiversity. These satellites are launched into Earth's orbit by governments and agencies such as the European Space Agency and NASA. These satellites are taken out of Earth's atmosphere by massive rockets like the one behind me. I'm an aerospace engineer, and today I want to talk about the relevance of space, satellites, and Earth observation to natural disasters. You might think that this may not affect you, yet every year millions of people are affected by hundreds of natural disaster events that happen globally. So how are these dealt with, these landslides, earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes? Well, a few academics, international organizations and governments got up together and created what is now known as the International Disaster Management Cycle. There are four stages of this cycle, and this process encapsulates some order around very chaotic events. The first stage is a response. After the natural disaster, it is important on the ground that we evacuate and help the local community to get into safe places. Next comes the recovery stage, trying to rebuild communities that have been adversely affected by such disasters. Now, this can take weeks, months, or even years to rebuild, and an example of a rebuilding process still continuing today is the Haiti earthquake. The next stage is mitigation. How do we, as a community, protect ourselves from future events? What resources do we have available to us to protect ourselves and to prevent further situations occurring like this? And finally, preparedness. How do we educate people on the ground to respond adequately? How do we predict future events? And how do we learn more about the environment around us? So, getting back to my earlier question, what does any of this have to do with space and satellites? In short, all of the four stages of this cycle are relying heavily on advanced images from satellites. 
To encapsulate this, we're going to look at an example. Let's pretend for a minute that we're in the United States. More specifically, let's say that we're in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has been hit by magnitude 3 earthquake. And for anybody who spent some time in Los Angeles here, this is not terribly uncommon. Now, the Los Angeles Emergency Department will activate a disaster mechanism, and NASA will transfer satellite imagery on the ground to the responders. This imagery will contain detailed information that will help the response on the ground. This information includes things such as which buildings have been damaged, where are the casualties located, and where are the worst affected areas. How do we get to these areas? Are the routes that we're trying to use to get to victims blocked? And how can we evacuate everybody safely? So, this image is given to LA free from one of NASA's many satellites. And the time to acquire this imagery is very, very short. This is amazing. So, we have now assessed the damage, we have evacu evacu <laughs> evacuated the victims, and we are now moving on to the second stage of the cycle, the recovery. We didn't think it before, but now we know that NASA has saved the lives of ordinary people in the US all the time. This is perfect. However, what is the problem with this? If we revisit this example again, but instead of being in the United States, let's say we're somewhere else, like Guatemala. We are exploring one of Guatemala's many beautiful lakes when suddenly we feel tremors. Without knowing it, we're at the epicenter of a magnitude 5 earthquake. Again, this is not that uncommon in Guatemala. So, the Guatemalan government declare a state of emergency, and the Guatemalan Space Agency transfer imagery to the local authorities that will save lives. Except, there is no Guatemalan Space Agency, and there are no Guatemalan satellites. And therefore, there is absolutely no imagery to give the local authorities to help save lives. So what do we do? What about the people who are trapped in the situation that have been adversely affected? Luckily, there is a charter called the International Charter on Space and Disasters. This is a non-binding charter that was organized by the European Space Agency. It gives humanitarian satellite data to nations that need it most in times of catastrophic disasters. It's kind of like an elite club for space members such as NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency. The way it works is pretty simple. The Guatemalan local authorities declare a state of emergency on the ground. Thus, they activate the mechanism. NASA, ESA, and the other members of this club then look at their historical database to find images that their own satellites have collected of this area. They then hand over these images to the local authorities on the ground who use them to, again, do things like assess damage and evacuate casualties. So wait, now we have both Guatemala and the US receiving satellite imagery to save lives. This is amazing. We are now globally saving lives through satellite images. Except we are still not. There are inherent problems with the International Charter. What if, for example, the last time that a satellite has flown over Guatemala was weeks ago? That's not going to help our earthquake, which happened merely hours ago. Or, let's say a satellite is due to fly over Guatemala tomorrow, but there is extreme cloud coverage, which often comes with adverse weather that creates these situations. We cannot get imagery of the ground in the epicenter. I mean, not that this really matters, because Guatemala doesn't have satellites anyway. Guatemala is in the highest category of the World Risk Index for Natural Disasters. And, interestingly, so are most of the countries that are in that index unavailable to provide their own satellite imagery. Now, when you and I are privy to technology that could, but is not saving lives globally, this system that I've just outlined, this process in emergency situations, is broken. There are, curr there are currently ways to fix this problem. My company, Fusion Space Technologies, is working on solving this very problem. 
We are in the process of creating data sharing processes that could save lives in catastrophic situations. The three main problems that we have discovered with the current system include the resolution, which is the detail in the images provided by satellites. This is often too low to be able to be used by organizations to analyze the data. So for example, urban flooding is a great example of this. When you look at the satellite image of an urban area, it is nearly impossible to discern the difference between what might be a tarmac road and flooding. The second problem is a refresh rate of the data, or how often a satellite will pass over the same land area to acquire imagery. It could take months or even years for a satellite to pass over certain areas of the world. This isn't going to be very helpful to us in our earthquake when we need this imagery right now. And the third problem with this is the cost of acquiring dat data from satellites, and especially from large satellite providers. I mean, this kind of makes sense. If you think about the tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars that it takes to launch a satellite into space. And this isn't even taking into account the money that is required for designing, manufacturing, and servicing such a satellite. My current company is working with the Space Generation Advisory Council to look at the problems encapsulating the system and to try and deal with them. Our solution has been to look at technologies that already exist that can provide us with answers to these problems. We are looking at unmanned aerial vehicles, otherwise known more commonly as drones. Our solution is this. Fusion Space Technologies integrates data from satellites and drones and provides ultra-high resolution mapping and creates very high refresh rates on this data. In fact, the world's highest refresh rates. What this means is that by integrating satellite and drone data, we are able to see more, we are able to see faster, and we are able to better analyze the data that we are getting. OK, so now we have solved, although technically very challenging, two of the problems associated with the current system. What about the third? What about the cost of the data? How does integrating data from satellites and drones increase the accessibility of this data to emerging economies? Well, this was our biggest problem. We have been able to reduce the size of this problem by looking at innovative ways of using our business model. We are selling our data to both the public and the private sector to reduce the cost of our research and design. To make this data affordable to everybody, there are two stages involved. Firstly, the data collection, and then the analytics. To collect the data, as we know, it is very expensive to achieve high-level, high-resolution images from satellites. We're not doing that. What we're doing instead is using old satellite data that has been archived for a long time and is therefore free. We are superimposing on top of that drone data. We are creating the world's first platform to collect crowdsourced drone data from people on the ground in emergency situations, such as aid and relief organizations. By combining old satellite data and new drone data, the solution that we get is actually better than any of the two of those by themselves. So now we have the data. We then use this data to perform analytics. We use advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence to create insights that we, that we are given by the data around an emergency. And this is where the magic really happens. By selling this data, to large industries who find this data not only important, but valuable, such as the insurance, the agriculture, and the telecommunication industries. We are able to share the research and design costs of our data across many sectors, thus allowing us to subsidize the cost of the data that we give to nations during event emergency events to nearly zero. We have thus been able to create data that is equally accessible to all countries and is low cost, 
high resolution, it comes at a time when industries and economies need this most during natural disaster events. But what this really means is that we are able to reduce the growing technological inequality between developed nations who are flourishing and relying on industries and technologies that are not currently available to emerging economies. We are able to slow down, even if just minutely, the growing differences in the living standards across the world. So, I challenge all of you to look at the technologies that you use in your daily lives, that surround you, that you don't even think twice about. How can you innovate on those technologies, and how can you use them to create a world that is better for people that you may have never even met? So getting back to my original question, what do space and satellites have to do with natural disasters? The answer is simple. As we now know, it has everything to do with them. Thank you.